Finally, after two years, we are resuming our on-site worship service today, simultaneous with this online worship video. This is a bittersweet moment for me and for many of you. Sweet because we rejoice at the privilege and the opportunity to be able to gather again physically, to have face-to-face -face worship together. But there's a tinge of sadness as we remember the people dear to us that we have lost during this pandemic. Hopefully, this will usher in a new season of hope and renewal for each of us individually and together as a church. Indeed, in uncertain times like this, Jesus is our only firm foundation where we can stand on. As we join our worship leader in singing this song, may we make this our personal declaration before God today. Question, have you ever been to a wedding where the bride was totally unprepared for the ceremony? Have you ever seen a bride who overslept on her wedding day or did not have a prepared vow for the event? 
or was not wearing a wedding gown because it was not yet ready. In my 12 years officiating dozens of weddings, I've never seen an unprepared bride. Overprepared bride, yes, I've seen a lot, but unprepared, I've never seen one. Often it would take months, sometimes even years for the bride and the groom to prepare for the wedding, from the planning to the wedding date, to the wedding venue, to the wedding dress, to the wedding invitations, yes, the wed invitation list, to the wedding vows, to the wedding reception, to the wedding cake, and then a program. No bride ever comes unprepared for her wedding. It is probably the most important day in her life up to that point. It is years in the making, and no bride on her right mind would not prepare for it. Maybe that's why Jesus often uses the analogy of a bride and a groom to describe our relationship with him and his eventual return for us someday. The scriptures would often allude to the Jewish wedding ceremony as a blueprint, as a foreshadow of the covenant relationship between the heavenly bridegroom, who is Jesus Christ, and the earthly bride, which is a church. Now, why a wedding? What does this tell us about Jesus' second coming? and how we are to get ready for it. To get this, we have to understand that the Jewish wedding ceremony is very much different from our weddings today. There are five stages to a Jewish wedding. The first is the arrangement of marriage. This is like a period of matchmaking. In ancient times, it is the Hebrew father of the groom who would choose the son's bride. The son would then honor his father's decision and choice, and the arrangement plans would now begin. Once the selection had been made and the girl agreed, the parents would now prepare the ketubah. Can you say to the person next to you, ketubah? The ketubah is the marriage covenant. It is like a written contract or a written promise to the bride. Here, the mohair, or the bridal price that the groom must pay to purchase his bride was determined, together with other terms of the wedding, as well as the responsibilities and the obligations of both parties. Once the ketubah was agreed upon by both parties, they now move on to the second stage, what we call the betrothal, or the engagement ceremony. First, the groom and the bride would separately undergo ritual cleansing by immersion in water, after which they would exchange vows and seal the covenant relationship with a cup of wine. The groom would then pay the mohair or the bridal price to show his love for her. Once the bridegroom paid the price, the marriage covenant was thereby established, and the couple was considered legally married. They are now regarded as husband and wife, even though the marriage was not consummated yet, meaning they did not live in the same house or have sexual relations yet. From that moment on, the bride was already set apart exclusively for her bridegroom. The third stage is the preparation. After the betrothal ceremony, the bride and the groom would return to their respective parents' house. During this period of around one year, the groom would start preparing a place for the two to live. This was normally done by adding an additional room to his father's house. While the groom was busy, with her future home, the bride was busy preparing herself for the big day and for married life. The, prepare, the preparation for the bride usually involved three things. One, the bride was observed for her purity. The custom required at least a full nine months to pass 
in order to ensure that the bride was not pregnant or that she was still a virgin. Two, the bride would consecrate herself. She would make sure that she was totally set apart for her future husband. Three, she made her own wedding garments. Remember, they did not have bridal shops back then. So the bride had to spend hours upon hours preparing for her wedding gown. Now, towards the end of the year-long betrothal period, the bride waited with great expectancy for the groom to come. And then the fourth stage, which is the actual wedding ceremony, would take place. The exact day of the ceremony was not known to both the bride and the groom. It comes as a surprise because it is the groom's father who would determine when the time was right based on his own assessment of the readiness of the couple's living accommodations that his son was building. It is the groom's father who would issue the approval for the ceremony to begin. So whenever the groom would be asked the date of his wedding, he could only say, no one knows except my father. Sounds familiar? I will get back to this later. On the wedding day, the groom, together with his best man and the whole male entourage or escorts, would then go to the bride's home in a torch-lit procession. He would come to take his bride to live with him at the place that he has prepared. Now, although the bride was more or less expecting her groom to come for her, she did not know the exact time or the exact day of his coming. Remember, there are no cell phones or social media back then. The taking of the bride or the so-called the snatching of the bride usually took place at night, not in the morning or afternoon as is custom for our weddings today. So even late in the evening, the bride and her bridesmaids would keep their oil lamps burning in case it was that night for the wedding to take place. The groom's arrival was announced and preceded by his groomsmen who would lead the wedding procession through the streets. And he would be shouting, Behold, the bride's groom the bridegroom comes, and then they would blow the shofar or the trumpet. The shout and the trumpet would forewarn the bride to get ready for the coming of the groom. Because the moment he arrives, there is no more time for the bride to prepare. They would have to leave immediately. So whatever she was wearing, whatever she has with her, However she looks, it's what she will be at her wedding ceremony. If she is still in her rollers or she is half finished with her makeup, then that's how she's going to look on her big day. After the groom received the bride together with her female attendants, the bridesmaids, the now complete entourage would proceed to the groom's house. Shortly after arrival, the bride and the groom would be escorted to the bridal chamber or the hapa. Prior to entering the chamber, the bride remained veiled so that no one could see her face. While the groomsmen and the bridesmaid waited outside, the bride and the groom would enter the bridal chamber to consummate their marriage with physical union for the very first time. This is to be followed by the last stage of the Jewish wedding, which is the wedding feast, which was considered to be the highlight of the wedding ceremony. It was much more extensive than the wedding reception that we are familiar with today. The Jewish wedding feast consisted of seven full days of food, music, dance and celebration and the primary purpose of the feast was to honor the groom 
not a bride. The focus of our weddings today is a bride. But here, in a Jewish wedding feast, all the guests were expected to compose poems or to sing songs to honor the groom. Take note that during the seven days of wedding festivities, the bride remained hidden in the bridal chamber. At the conclusion of those seven days comes the finale, wherein the groom would bring his bride out of the bridal chamber, now with her veil removed, and would present her in her beautiful wedding garments for the very first time for all the wedding guests to see. The bride would display her beauty and her grace to all who were present and they would appreciate her by showing the respect and admiration for her. And they live happily ever after. This is not just the story of the wedding between a Jewish man and woman. And this is because this is also the story of our wedding, the wedding between Jesus Christ and his church. One cannot help but notice the many parallels between the Jewish wedding and the stages of our relationship with Jesus Christ and the coming events of the end times. So how can we know future events concerning Jesus' return based on the five stages of the Jewish wedding ceremony? And how can we use them to prepare for his return? Jesus' first coming was like the first stage in a Jewish wedding, the arrangement of marriage. Our Heavenly Father so loved the world that he arranged a marriage between his son and humankind. He chose the church as his bride, and Jesus agreed to the choice. John chapter 15, verse 16, Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Ephesians 1, verse 4, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. The Heavenly Father also sent his matchmaker, the Holy Spirit, to invite us to become the bride of Christ by saying yes to his invitation. The ketubah, or the marriage covenant, was laid out by Jesus to describe what a relationship with him would include. He declared this at the Last Supper. This is the new covenant in my blood. He then sealed the betrothal covenant with a cup of wine. He took the cup, saying, Now Jesus the bridegroom then gave up his life on the cross as the mohair or the bride price to purchase us with his blood. For all who have said yes to the Holy Spirit's invitation to be the bride of Christ, a betrothal ceremony has taken place. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 tells us, For I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. As his betrothed wife or bride, we also partake of a ritual cleansing similar to an ancient Jewish bride when we get baptized. And we seal the marriage covenant with a cup of wine every time we partake of the communion. We are now in the third stage of the Jewish wedding, the period of preparation, while we wait for Jesus our bridegroom to return. But how does the bride know that her groom will return when he is gone for so long? How do we know that Jesus will return for us when it's been nearly 2,000 years? Will we wait for nothing? What gives the bride certainty? Well, the groom does not leave without first assuring the bride that he will come back to get her. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 3, Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house. I would not tell you this if it were not true. I am going there to prepare a place for you. After I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. He assures us that he will come back for us someday. And the seal is the Holy Spirit. So what is Jesus doing now? Just like the groom in a Jewish wedding, he has gone back to his father's house in heaven to prepare a place for us. And what are we supposed to do while we wait for his return? The same things that the Jewish bride would be doing. One, we wait expectantly for his return since we don't know the exact day or hour. Two, to make ourselves ready, just like any Jewish bride, we should prepare our wedding garments as well as all the things that we are to bring to the wedding ceremony. Revelations chapter 17 verses 7 to 8 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. At the cross, Jesus has already provided for us the wedding garment of his perfect righteousness. 3. We should keep ourselves pure and set apart as we look forward to our life together with Jesus someday. That's why we are to pursue holiness and Christ-likeness as we await his second coming. The preparation period is coming to an end and the wedding celebration will soon take place as promised. But no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows, as Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 tells us. On that day that the heavenly Father will determine, he will say to Jesus, the dwelling places are now ready. Go, get your bride. At that time, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17 tells us what would happen next. The Lord himself will come down from heaven, accompanied by his male entourage, and there will be a shout, the voice of the archangel. And what will he be shouting? Behold, the bridegroom comes. Then the trumpet call of God, the shofar, will sound, and the bride, the church, will be caught up, will be snatched into the clouds to meet the groom, Jesus Christ, who will take us to the place that he has prepared for us. This is the rapture of the church. The wedding ceremony will be held, and the marriage supper of the Lamb will commence. In the same manner as a Jewish wedding party has wedding guests assembled in the groom's father's house when they arrived, so Christ and the church will find the Old Testament saints assembled in heaven when they arrive. They will serve as the wedding guests. Parallel to the custom of the Jewish groom and bride, entering into physical union after their arrival at the groom's father's house, thereby consummating their marriage, Christ and the church will experience spiritual union after their arrival at his father's house in heaven, thereby consummating the relationship that had been covenanted earlier. Corresponding with the Jewish bride, Remaining hidden in the bridal chamber for a period of seven days after arrival, the church will remain hidden for a period of seven years after arrival in heaven. While the seven-year tribulation is taking place on earth, the church will be in heaven totally hidden from the sight of those living on earth. Just as a Jewish groom brought his bride out of the bridal chamber at the conclusion of the seven days with her veil removed so that all could see his bride. So Christ will bring his church out of heaven 
during the second coming, at the conclusion of the seven-year tribulation period, in full view of all who are alive on earth, so that all can see who the true church is. As Colossians chapter 3, verse 4 tells us, when Christ, who is your life, appears and is revealed to the whole world, you also will appear with him in glory. Now, the question is, will we be ready when he comes? Ready is such an abstract word. How can you say that you are ready? Jesus has given us prophecies and signs for us to know that it's time to get ready. There are nearly 500 prophecies in the Bible concerning his second coming. Included in these prophecies, God has also given us an abundance of signs to look out for to know how soon his return will be. A few of those signs include signs in the world of politics, including wars, conflicts, and alliances, the rise of Russia and the Muslim world, signs in our society, immorality, decadence, racial tensions, signs of technology, signs of nature, as we are seeing now with pandemics, plagues, locusts, natural disasters, signs concerning Israel, the rebirth of the nation, the return of the exiles from the Yapura, celestial signs, and many more. All these signs suggest that now is a season of the Lord's return. So how can we get ourselves ready knowing that the time is near? Jesus knows we are going to ask that. That's why he already gave us the answer in Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 48. I will not be reading the whole passage, but here Jesus gave us three illustrations to tell us what we are supposed to do before his return. First is the image of a servant waiting for his master to come home from a wedding feast. Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 38 tells us, be dressed, ready for service, and have your lamps shining. Be like servants who are waiting for their master to come home from a wedding party. When he comes and knocks, the servants immediately open the door for him. They will be blessed when their master comes home because he sees that they were watching for him. The King James Version would put it as, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. In biblical times, most people wore, wore tunics that would reach down to around the knees. When servants had to run or to serve, they would tie the longer part of the tunic around their thighs in order to be more agile, to be more mobile and active and so as not to impede their movement. It was also a figure of speech that time to be alert and ready. When you would hear the term, gird your loins, it usually means to prepare yourself and be ready for battle. The first thing Jesus tells us spiritually is to gird our loins, to be spiritually active, to be spiritually sharp and ready to respond. Jesus also tells his disciples to keep their lamps burning like servants waiting for the master to return so that when he comes home from a wedding feast and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Such wedding feasts could last for days, often for a week, so there's no way of knowing which day the master would come back home. Also in biblical times, there were no clocks, no cell phones, no electricity in the home. There were no street lights outside or fluorescent bulbs inside to help you find your way in the middle of the night. If you were expecting a visitor in the evening, you would keep an oil lamp burning so that when he knocked on the door, 
you could see him to let him in. So while a servant needed to stay up, be alert, he also had to keep the lamps burning, which required constant maintenance. The wicks had to be trimmed and the oil replenished. It was considered a disgrace to the master if he came home and no one attended to him. No one would wash his feet or provide him light. And it would even be worse if he was locked out of his own home. So here, you can tell a good servant from a bad one. The good servant cared for the welfare and honor of his master. In the same way, as we await Christ's return, we must keep our spiritual light burning. Let's look at a real example of a good servant who waited for her master. In Luke chapter 2, there was a prophetess named Anna. The Bible tells us that though she was very old, she never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. That's why when baby Jesus first showed up at the temple, she recognized who he was, even if he was just a baby. Because of her spiritual alertness, because of her spiritual sharpness, she immediately recognized the Savior. In the same way, during Jesus' second coming, we need to keep watch, be alert at all times. Don't fall asleep spiritually. How? By constantly praying, fasting, and worshiping. That's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verse 33, Be on guard, keep awake, watch and pray, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. Charles Spurgeon uses the analogy of his dogs to show how we should expectantly wait for our master's return. He said that the very moment that he was speaking, his dogs were sitting inside his house, his front door, awaiting his return. At the first sound of his car entering the driveway, they would lift up their voices with delight because their master is coming home. Then he adds, and I quote, Oh, if we loved our Lord as dogs love their master, how we should catch the first sound of his coming and be waiting, always waiting, and never happy until at last we should see him. End of quote. The second illustration in this passage is the image of a thief breaking into a house in the middle of the night. If the owner had known when the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. He would have been prepared and waiting. He would have called the police and ready and waiting to arrest him and take him to jail. The problem is that thieves do not inform you in advance when they will come to break into your house and steal from you. You have to be ready for whenever that would occur. So. You prepare safety measures beforehand, such as locking the door and windows or setting up CCTVs or alarms. In ancient times, they didn't have those, so it meant someone has to stay up and keep watch, the so-called watchmen. Houses during Jesus' time were usually made of sun-dried mud bricks. Just like in the story of the paralytic with his four friends, when they dug through the ceiling and lowered their friends so that Jesus could heal him. This is the way thieves would normally break into houses during that time, by digging a hole through the walls or ceiling, then break into the house and steal. Now, two important principles to learn here. One, you prepare before the thief comes. You don't prepare when the thief is already breaking into your house. In the same way, 
we should get ready for Jesus' return now, not later when he has already come. You don't say to the thief, Wait lang ah, mag-install muna ako ng alarm. Wait ka lang muna dyan sa labas. Number two, you install locks and alarms to prevent. This is preventive. How then can we get ready now? Do we stockpile food as some do? Do we sell everything we have? Live in communes and dress in black? Do we stare into the sky waiting for him to come? The Jehovah's Witnesses actually did this in 1975. They said that they calculated the exact date that Jesus would come. So they all stood there, staring at the sky, waiting. But he did not come. The answer how to get ready is not found in the world because the spiritual battleground is in our minds and in our hearts. What distracts us from focusing on God? What distracts us from reading His Word? What causes us to sin? The book of James tells us that sin is conceived in the mind. So the battle to get ready is fought in the battleground of the mind. If you want to be ready, you must renew your mind and battle the sins in your life to remain holy and set apart for Christ when he returns. And we do that by reading God's word to prevent us from sinning. So number one, keep watch. Two, be prepared spiritually. And three, be faithful. Keep on doing the work that Jesus Christ has entrusted us to do. Why are you standing there, gazing into heaven? Jesus is coming back, so get busy, the Bible tells us. If you are expecting the president to come to your house, you won't be sitting pretty. Instead, you would probably repaint the walls and repair the things in your house that needed repairs. In the same way, if you are expecting the King of Kings to come, how should your life look like? What do you need to fix? What do you need to repair? What do you, what do you need to repaint in your life right now? Jesus said, Who is the wise and trusted servant that the master trusts to give the other servants their food at the right time? When the master comes and finds the servant doing his work, the servant will be blessed. I tell you the truth, the master will choose that servant to take care of everything he owns. Now, to give the other servants their food at the right time means we are called to take care of those we are entrusted with, to use our time, our talent, and our treasures to serve him and to serve others. That is being a faithful steward. Take note, don't mistake being busy as being faithful. Churches today easily mistake programs, ministries, meetings, activities as being faithful. The primary task of the bride is called to do while waiting, is to keep her first love devotion to her bridegroom. In the same way, we are called to love Jesus as we do our ministries, as we do our missions, as we do our programs. And the passage continues that a faithful servant will be rewarded in the end. Now, there are two reasons why we are to keep watch, to be ready and to be faithful. The reason for readiness when the Lord returns, He will judge everyone in accordance with the light that they have been given. We will give an account someday. The second is the motivation for our readiness. Look again at verse 37, which ties everything together. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. 
Now, look at what the master does. This master, after returning and finding the servant watching and waiting, would dress himself up to serve them, the servants. He has them reclined at the table, relaxing, and then he, the master, comes and serves them. Just think how honored the servants must have felt to be the servants of this master. And that's how they could love their master. That's how they could wait on him night after night because their master loved them. They could love their master because their master loved them and he showed it to them. And this is what Jesus does for us. He demonstrated his love for his disciples by serving them, by washing their feet. The Apostle Paul says that he gave up his, all of his heavenly glory and took the very nature of a servant. And finally, as an ultimate demonstration of his love, what did he do? He laid down his life for us. He gave us his life. This was his ultimate expression of service, his ultimate expression of love, that he gave us his all, including himself. Now, we can understand why the good servant will wait and watch for his master and why he obeys and listens to his master because he understood and knew that the master loves him and would lay down even his own life for him. Our hearts, in the same way, should be burning with gratitude for what the Lord Jesus had done for us. Not only did he save us, he, he told us even in these times how to be prepared for his coming. He will be coming soon, like a thief. The time to be prepared is not later, but now. So let us watch and wait and eagerly anticipate his coming. And when he comes and find us faithful, watching and ready, we will be received into his kingdom and God will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Now let me end with the story. During one of his expeditions to the Antarctic, Sir Ernest Shackleton needed to leave some of his men behind on Elephant Island. He promised that he was going to return for them and bring them home to England. But due to unforeseen circumstances, his return was delayed. By the time he could go back to get them, the sea had already frozen over and he had no access to that island. Three times he tried to reach them, but he was prevented by the frozen ice. Finally, on his fourth attempt, he broke through and found a narrow channel leading towards the island. Much to his surprise, he found his men waiting for him, their, sur their supplies already packed and ready to board. So on their way home to England, Sir Ernest Shackleton asked them how they knew to be ready for him that day. His men told him they didn't know when he would return, but they were sure he would. So every morning, the leader of the men would roll up his sleeping bag and pack up his gear and told the others, get your things ready. The boss may come today. Therefore, they were prepared for their master's return. Now, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to this earth is much more certain than Sir Shackleton's return to the Elephant Island. Christ's promise to return to claim his redeemed is established upon his word and his character, and nothing can stop him from coming back. And it is still this blessed hope of all who love him, a hope that will not fail. My prayer is that each one of us, like those men 
on Elephant Island would get up every morning waiting, ready, and faithful. May our Savior find in us daily hearts that are ready to receive Him and also ready for that glorious day. I will leave with you Luke chapter 21, verse 36. So be ready all the time. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. As a response song is being played, may we reflect on this question. Where do you stand when he returns? Are you under God's wrath or are you under God's grace? Can you truly say that you are ready for his coming? You have a decision to make today and the time to do it is now. Let us pray. Father God, may you forgive us, your church, for being asleep for so long that we have not been preparing ourselves for the return of your Son. It is time to awaken the Bride of Christ that we may be ready for his coming. Help us to hold fast to your promise that Jesus will come on the day that you have appointed. Lord Jesus, Help us to live our lives like we really believe that you are coming back for us. As we wait, 
Help us to live as if you are returning today, for we don't want to be caught unprepared when you come. May you find us waiting, eager in joyful prayer, ready and faithful. Lord, you said that no one knows the day or the hour when that will be. Therefore, be with us always so that you may guide our actions, our thoughts, our words, and our desires, that they may be in accordance with your will. Keep us pure and consecrated, holy and righteous, as we continue to live in this world, that our bridal gown won't be stained on our wedding day. Continue to mold us, refine us, that we may continue to be Christ-like. Guide us, guard us, protect us, and rule over us so that on the last day we will still be in communion with you. May we be ready to receive Christ when he comes in glory and to share in the wedding feast you have prepared for us. Amidst the difficulties, the hardships of life here on earth, may we draw comfort from the fact that Jesus is coming back for us again. There are days on this earth that we yearn for Jesus to come now. For the more we know you, the more we want to go home with you. For the most blessed life on this earth is only a shred of the happiness we will feel in heaven in your presence. May our love for you and the thought of your embrace when we arrive home in heaven someday keep us motivated to continue to serve you, to live for you, and to finish the task that you have entrusted us. We trust in your ways and pray for your will over all else and everything we desire. Come, Lord Jesus, come now, come soon to bring us home. This is our prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let us now prepare ourselves for the communion. The communion is not only a remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross, that by giving up his body, he paid the mohair or the bridal price to redeem us. And he did this in order to show how much he loves us. As we drink the cup, it is also a reminder that we are, we are already betrothed to Him once we accepted the Holy Spirit's invitation to be part of the Church, the Bride of Christ. But as we partake the communion, this is also forward-looking to that day when we will drink this cup again during the marriage supper of the Lamb, after which we will live with Him forever the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body given up for you do this in remembrance of me then he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me to conclude, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer. You can pray in English or Chinese according to your preference. And to see the young two top one like it so. Gunditile,
，心静所安。And now for some announcements. I thank God for your generous giving. As of last Sunday, we have almost reached our goal for this year's New Year Thanksgiving offering. We will be receiving your expressions of thanksgiving to the Lord only until next Sunday, the 10th of April. You are under no obligation to give, but if it is your prayerful desire to worship God through your offering. Please kindly check out our Facebook page as to how you can give. Also, to give you more convenient options, we now have a new BDO account. You can check the details here or on our Facebook page. Next, if you wish to join our on-site worship service next Sunday, you should meet these two requirements. One. You have to be fully vaccinated. This is in compliance with government guidelines for mass gatherings. And two, you must pre-register. This is for us to assess the number of attendees beforehand for social distancing. So, if you are fully vaccinated and you have pre-registered, then you are more than welcome to attend. Now, how do you register? There are two ways that you can do this. One by scanning the QR code shown here, then fill out the registration form. Or two by going to the link posted here, then fill out the form. You can also find the QR code in the link on our NMEC Facebook page and Viber group. The cutoff for online registration that is done every week is Friday at 8 p.m. Now question. Can my kids attend? Take note: our children's ministry will continue to be online, so we will leave that to the parents' discretion. Children, regardless of their vaccination status, are allowed to attend, provided they are accompanied by their fully vaccinated parents or close relatives. Next, through these past two years. The Enmec building may be closed, but our different ministries and small groups do continue. I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of our online ministry volunteers, our worship teams, Sunday school teachers and staff, our church and small group leaders that have worked so hard behind the scenes to bring all our Sunday worship services to you. Next, our Joyful Hope Counseling Ministry will conduct a two-part webinar series on the theme, Companioning, Walking with Someone Through Their Anxiety. It will be held on two consecutive Thursdays, April 21 and 28 at 8 p.m. The topic on April 21 is about caring for others, while on April 28 it will be about caring for self. Webinar is exclusively for NMEC members. Small group and discipleship leaders are highly encouraged to attend. Next, we will launch our NMEC prayer network via Viber this April 4th. If you wish to receive prayer items about the church and about members in need of prayers, please register with Pastor Jean Chan. You are also encouraged to send in your prayer concerns. Before posting, we will first obtain the permission of the person or family concerned. If you sincerely wish to pray for NMEC and our members, we strongly encourage you to register. If you want to be part of a discipleship group or a small group, contact any of the pastoral team members, and we will be happy to connect you to a group. Lastly, if you wish to know more about New Millennium Evangelical Church, we encourage you to follow our Facebook page or to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you for worshiping with us. Now may we receive the benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. May His face continue to shine upon you, and may He be gracious to you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. 
愿主耶稣基督的恩惠、上帝听探、圣灵的感动，甲咱众人撒个地雷，对大地高主过来。阿门。We love you. We thank God for you, and we are praying for you. Remember, the best is yet to come.